Thank you for joining us online as we are continuing our sermon series, Life with Jesus, through the Gospel of Mark. The goal of this series is go through the Gospel in light of seeing Jesus as our teacher and our Lord and ultimately our King, and then following after Jesus. Uh, Last week, uh, Hannah spoke about the temptations of hurry, people-pleasing, and notoriety, and the practices that we combat that. And uh, But this week, I want us to just begin to ask, even now if you're listening, to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth that we need today to be His disciples, to unveil the parts of us that need to be addressed and I hope just like a meal that we could leave filled with God's like presence, his word, and, and, it, and it just indwells within us. And so I'm going to give you uh, give us some background of this passage. Jesus has started his ministry and all the people are coming out of the woodwork to see what Jesus is all about. And crowds begin to form in this small town. You can just see and hear. Just imagine that with me. Some people are coming just to check out Jesus. Others have legitimate needs that need to be addressed. And Jesus continues to preach, repent, the kingdom of God is here. Repent, rethink your life in light of heaven being opened up to you. So let's begin. Mark 2, 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Just imagine, people are filling the house. And this ain't a big house. This is like a tiny house, two to three bedrooms. And people from all over are jamming in, like a Taylor Swift concert, crowding lines everywhere. And and just imagine the streets are packed. Verse 3, some men came to bring him, a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowds, they made an opening on the roof above Jesus, digging through it, and then lower the mat that the man was laying on. Just imagine that with me. The sound of hammers and chisels and tiles being removed from the roof. And then this man begins to be dropped through on his bed. And now you got a new skylight. And just like, I was just thinking, don't normalize this moment because we've heard this before. This is a shocking moment. People are busting up your roof and you don't even have State Farm back then. Who's going to fix this? Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, without being phased by the construction site, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, now, of course, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fella talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right? This is the first time Jesus is getting backlash in this ministry. These teachers don't like how Jesus is teaching nor healing. I smell jealousy and contempt to, to maybe due to the loss of influence, the loss of authority with these people. They are criticizing Jesus, becoming embittered, which ultimately we know leads to the crucifixion of Jesus, his murder. And I want to point this out because Jesus pointed it out. Anger and bitterness is no small matter. At, at its root, and at its root, it is, is the root of so many of our problems, of our deep pains, and of the problems of our world. You, you and I, as disciples of Jesus, need to get a hold of our anger and bitterness that it does not control us or it does not project into our future. Now, they're offended by Jesus. Jesus is not doing it right. He's not what they expected nor wanted. Who could forgive sin but God alone? Verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Imagine Jesus just answering you directly what you're thinking. And he says to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. This is a huge 
Huge statement. Jesus is letting everyone know. Uh, he's letting them in on his divinity in this moment. He is saying, I'm the God man. I'm the Messiah. I'm the king that you've been looking for. And he says to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all. This, is, this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. That's God's word. I love that. Today, I want to challenge us in the way we believe our worldview, how we see the world and God's reality, how God has made his reality, his world. In this passage, we see three, really four groups of people, but we're going to focus on mostly three, the paralyzed man, the angry teachers, and the four friends. And the, and the last one is the crowd, right? And now and we're going to focus mostly on the paralyzed man, the paralyzed man. This point will take up most of the message. The Bible doesn't say how long this man has been paralyzed. If it was from birth or from an accident, how, how old he was, if he had a family, what his backstory. All we know is he is in an awful situation and he needs to get something done. And they're going to Jesus. But something strange happens here. Jesus doesn't seem to understand the situation. Jesus turns to this paralyzed man. And instead of saying, get up, you're healed, let's go. He, Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, is Jesus the only one not noticing what's going on? Isn't it obvious? Is he confused? It might seem like Jesus is unaware in this moment, but I wonder if we would lean in that we are the ones that are easily unaware. And Jesus knows what he's talking about. Because Jesus is addressing the main issue here, the main sickness in all of us. Jesus says to this man and to us today, you think your greatest need is healing or to fill in the blank, finances, relationships, anxiety, school, work, parenting, our kids, or your parents, success, happiness. But Jesus is saying, I assure you that you have a much more significant need. The greatest problem right now is is not your suffering that you're facing, but your sin, but your sin. This was a hard message for me because I know so many people who are listening to this are facing some suffering. They have some giants in their life they, that have been just wrecking them. They're facing pain. They're in the peak of the storm. They have had hard days and hard moments. And I don't want to sound insensitive to where you are today. Yet, I want to stay faithful to what Jesus is saying to us through this text and what he would convey to us today as his disciples and followers and listeners. Yes, Jesus knows that this man wants more than anything. <laughs> this healing, he has prayed prayers, he has made deals, he has cried tears, he was screaming frustration, he has gotten angry. And for many of us today, we have pleaded with God, Lord, would you do this? Do this one thing. I will, if you would do this, I will do that, right? Some of us, we've, we've been trying to make deals with God for good reasons and some of us for selfish gain. Yet Jesus goes deeper and this is for me and for many of us. Our prayers, our seeking, our worship, our, our service can have to do more with Jesus fulfilling what I need and I want in the moment rather than treating Jesus as king. Seeing Jesus as king. Are we using Jesus to get outcomes to what, the, what we are really saying we would believe would save me, make me whole, or make me happy? Is Jesus a means to an end? We don't want Jesus at the end of the day because at the heart of our hearts, Jesus is not enough. In, in the past, I've used this a quote from Jim Carrey, who was a comedian and actor who started from poverty and rose up into fame and got all the things he thought he wanted. And he has, he has this quote, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed so they can see that that's not the answer. What he's saying is that people will chase wealth, success, fame, sex, whatever, and think it will bring them happiness, even relationships. Once they attain it, they'll say to themselves, that's it? That's what all the hype is about? 
I don't feel happy. I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel anything. It's not enough because we are still sick. And, and Jesus tells this man, you're sicker than you know. Addressing the main issue that sin will ultimately separate us from God, from ourselves, and from one another, and it will kill our soul. And, and, and I got this from Tim Keller, but from he addresses the voyage of the Dawn Shredder by C.S. Lewis from the Chronicles of Narnia. And in this, in this book, there's a shrewd character named Eustace. And Eustace comes across as this, this character who just like wants to get things for himself, right? And he, he finds this great treasure and he celebrates how much it's going to change his life. And then he starts to conspire. Man, what if other people want this? How can I hoard it for myself? And eventually he falls asleep on this treasure. And when he wakes up, he wakes up as a dragon. Why a dragon? Because dragons are hoarders. Dragons are greedy. Dragons want to protect their fortune at all costs. It was a physical representation of the heart. Vicious, scaly, and covered in armor, keeping everyone at a distance. Yet, Eustace began to feel the weight of being a dragon, the constriction of being a dragon, the pain of being this dragon, and then being cut off from others, isolated, all alone with this treasure. And it was a curse, right? And now you see the great Aslan who leads, who, who, who leads this dragon to this garden well. And the dragon knows he cannot get into this water and, and, and get healed, right? So he can't get in the way he is. He cannot get in the way he is. This dragon tries to rip off the scales himself with no avail. And the lion says, Aslan says, you have to let me cut you. What a line. Eustace is afraid of the lion's claws, but he is desperate. And the book writes, the very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began to pull, off, pull the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. Yet with much work under all the scales was Eustace. And I share this with us because that's the gospel. The gospel is considered good news, but there has to be bad news. And the bad news is this. You're trying to save yourself in some way, and you cannot do it. You can't do it. You've been trying forever. But the good news is this. God is after you. He loves you. And his love is relentless. Sending his son to save you, to reconnect to you, and to the story of God and to the life of God. He wants you in the story of God. But we all need to let Jesus cleanse us, cleanse us off, rip off our scales, and it's going to hurt. And when Jesus makes some moves, it's going to hurt. And some of us, we're going to do our best to save whatever we think is going to save us over God. But we must keep us as followers of Jesus in the hands of him in his school, not only to save us, but to heal us and to make us and to send us. Now, I want to address, that's the paralyzed man. I want to address the teachers now, the embittered teachers. This is the group who knew all about God, yet could not notice God when he's right in their presence. I wonder sometimes if that's me. If I was in that story, if I was in that room, if I would be the one complaining and criticizing, Jesus, you're not doing it right. Jesus, you're not the, you're not the Jesus that I wanted. You're not the Messiah that I wanted. You cannot be him. Blinded by my desires, blinded by my worldview of what God is like because I want to control my world. I want to be God. How about you? If we would do a self-assessment, how would you? This is, I call this the, the embittered teacher's assessment. How would you, how would you uh, grade yourself here? And I got some questions. I have like six of them. Number one, do you practice what you preach? Do you practice what you preach? We can talk all about God's word and loving Jesus, but does it impact our decisions? Are you loving? Are you generous? Are you hoarding? Or are you generous? Are you forgiving? Are you releasing? Or are you keeping debt on people? Man, pressure on people, trying to get your payback. Are you presently? Are you present with people? 
Number two, do you expect more out of others than expect from yourself? Sometimes we, ex- we excuse our sin, but we uh, refuse to extend mercy to others because we are harsh in nature due to what we've been through. Number three, do you purposely lack accountability? You avoid it. You know people who will call you out and you keep them that way or you run from them and you live in a space where you cannot be questioned using avoidance tactics, fears, attitude, justifications to keep people at bay. Number four, do you focus on secondary matters while neglecting the weightier matters of justice, mercy, faithfulness, and love? Are those things even in our radar? Are we practicing those things because we're practicing the ways of Jesus? Is imitating Jesus optional? Number five, do you use other sin as a platform to reveal your superiority? Soapboxing their failures. Did you hear about such and such to get attention? And you have not even felt sorrow. I have not even felt sorrow. There's moments I can see myself soapboxing where I see other people sin and I say, at least I don't do that, right? But have I called out the sins or the things in my life that I do? And last question, are you bitter and reactive? Are people so careful around you because you will hurt them? You are not safe. You you take pride in saying, this is how it is, but you lack vulnerability. See, this can look like anger and, and joy. It can look fake like joy. Everything's great, right? But are we living out who God made us to be, or this avatar. I point these things out because I'm talking to myself. There is a Pharisee that I must declare war on in me. Because bitterness and resentment can kill us from the inside, leading to anxiety, depression, isolation, anger, stagnation, rage of the soul. We have to declare war at some point and go hand in hand with Jesus. See, so that was the embittered teachers. And now here, I want to talk about the four friends. The truth is, the paralyzed man, the embittered teachers, uh, the four friends and the crowd, they're all in us. They're in us. But I want to focus on the four friends here. There There is not any real description of these guys. But they took action and they overcame barriers. Barriers of laughter, being made fun of, fear, accusation, rejection. And it says in the word, Jesus saw their faith. Jesus saw their faith. Your action and your obedience is your faith. Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. Do what I do. Follow me. So as we close today, there are four ways we can respond today on how Jesus is showing us in this passage. And they're all in us. The teachers who complain, we can get bittered and dish out blame. The crowd who can do nothing and just watch and see what happens and get filled with apathy. Just looking out, I don't, I don't want to be in there. We're just watching. Or we can be the four friends. We can see the people in our lives. We can help overcome barriers and the excuses and take people to Jesus. Or we are the paralyzed man. Sometimes we need to call on a friend. We need to call on Jesus and we need to ask them to to ask our friends to take us to him. Who are you? Who am I in this story? Some of us, we have stopped bringing people to Jesus and we became the crowd. Some of us, we've forgotten that we are the paralyzed man, that we need to call on Jesus and we need to ask people to bring us to him. Man, have we stopped being the people like Jesus has asked us to be. I want Jesus to see my faith and see your faith. And this is so easy to do because of hurt, uh, because we have been disappointed. I have disappointed you. Life has disappointed you. Man, people have hurt you. Things have been hard. Or we get caught up with busyness. But in this In this passage, it is saying we have to wake up. 
Maybe we need to bust some roofs and we need to look around for the people around us and bring them to Jesus. I'm telling you, even right now, if the people are going through your minds, start writing down names and ask Jesus, how can I bring them to you? Don't sit back as the crowd. Don't criticize as the teachers. And don't continue to blame. Sometimes we need to bring ourselves to Jesus. Listen, it's never too late to be who you might have been because we believe in a God of resurrections so we need uh, who want to, who want us to get in on the story of God this is what we were created for for God and his kingdom of heaven repent rethink your life the kingdom of heaven is open to you and that changes everything start today ask God who you need to bring. Maybe it's yourself. If it's others, bring them. Then conspire and plan with Jesus and then bring them. Make it an act of faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this passage, there's so many directions we could have gone, but I pray right now if there are people listening and they are the paralyzed man and they need people brought, when they need to bring themselves I pray they call on you. They call on others. They call because they need to do anything they can to get to Jesus, Lord God. For those who are feeling the apathy and sitting in criticism, I pray we repent, Lord God. Repent is not just feeling that, but repent is turning the direction of Jesus. And we repent and we rethink the way we are living our life. That we rethink the way we are doing our faith, Lord God. And we say, Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And I pray we be like the four friends, Lord. We make a plan. We take the risks. We break down the barriers to get people to Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.